Next up, we have Julio speaking about GitOps Survival Guide Kubernetes Edition. I'm really curious of the stage is yours. Thank you. So that's very nice to be here, my first time on this conference. And I work on the OpenShift team at Red Hat. And before that, I used to work at AWS. And before that, I was at Red Hat. So I'm a boomerang, as they call me. I went uh, out and back. So in this course of this decade, I've been working with automating software delivery, as is usually called GitOps these days. We're going to talk about why. And well, that's what I have the most experience in practice. So I thought I should talk about that. And I don't really believe in best practices. So I'm not here to preach the correct way to do stuff. I'm just going to say some things that is the opposite. I think that if, you're, if you don't do too bad, perhaps the OK practice is the right thing for you at the moment, or even the practice that's temporarily not so good, but you certainly can't uh, do insecure things or unreliable things. I want to, and that's why I call it the survival guide. Like what's uh, the things that you absolutely must watch out for and what you can get away with perhaps. So, and how to get away with some things. Yeah. So my name is Julio and that's Fairman J on Twitter. If you are seeing this afterwards or wanna send some comments or feedback, I truly appreciate it. So let's go ahead. So as I mentioned, uh, this is about the continuous delivery process, the process of getting the changes from the hands of developers to, and transform that into value for customers. And ideally, that would be very simple and automatic. We would like to make that as fast as possible because as fast as those changes and that value gets to customers, we can get feedback and see if that sells more or if that sells less or if customers are happier or, or not and loop on, on changes. And that's pretty much the, the process behind many services and products at Amazon. Well, and how do we do this these days? How do we automate it? So we know that in the speed that we release changes to software these days, it's not uh, possible to do it manually for most companies. So developers usually build on Git and the many flavors and services for Git, like GitHub or GitLab, and that would trigger events usually. Of course, that's not the only way we can have scheduled events such as nightly builds and things like that. But all in all, a pipeline of some sort, we're going to talk about possible implementations of that. We'll build and test the artifacts that are going to be finally delivered to customers. That usually involves provisioning resources on the cloud, like on AWS services and things like that, and roll out the changes, like make the changes public and available, at least to some users. And then also we must monitor and clean up unused resources and things like this. So this sounds like very uh, familiar and straightforward to many of us, and I believe the, in the conceptual sense it makes a lot of uh, a lot of sense for any developer but as we do it in practice it's not so simple right we have to think uh, how many clouds are we using and even what we are calling a cloud because you know we say things like multi-cloud, but what do we mean by that? Is that like two clouds at the same time that are integrated or is it the possibility of changing the clouds if I ever change my mind? What does that actually mean? And am I locked in by any API or any service that I use on this cloud? And 
how many clusters or resources am I going to need? How I'm going to build it? How I'm going to keep it secure? And if that's well architected or not, or how to keep it safe. So this ends up being uh, very challenging according to the size of your architecture, the application components that you use, and so on and so forth. But uh, I usually try to keep it simple and sane, saying by, well, you just have to think what's the next step in this automation, how you can make it better, even if you can't make it fully automated or perfect, what's the next thing we can automate and, and grow from there. So that's the, the usual process. So that's not um, an all or nothing situation. I think it's very important to see the, the steps in the middle and try to keep in a way that you can evolve and progress. We're gonna talk about a lot about this idea of evolving and progressing these automations. So as I, as I said, a lot of this is going to be uh, provisioning resources on the cloud. So the, the way we perceive and use cloud services matters a lot in this automations. So one thing that we clear see as cloud computing or mean by cloud computing is things by like AWS computing services. So like EC2, Pinstall, QCS, EKS, and so on and so forth, you name it. So that's clearly something uh, known as cloud computing. But what about all those servers that we have out there? So in corporate data centers, in startups, in service buildings, in antennas, is that or cloud, can we make that part of the cloud? Is it the same kind of thing? Can we use the same technology? Is this different, right? And what about going even further into what is now discussed as the edge, right? So for example, cell phone antennas, like 5G antennas have a lot of uh, software and hardware uh, right in the installation itself. So it doesn't make sense to talk a lot about uh, cloud 5G antennas, but there is a service for that actually announced at last reInvent by AWS. But uh, for operators still using physical antennas, they actually need that harder. And even projects like satellites that are becoming more common in startups exploring space and even in education, and not to mention self-driven vehicles and a lot of things that has computing on board. So is that uh, what we understand and can bridge to cloud computing and to manage these resources in the same kind of tools? So that's the, that's the, the idea behind uh, not only Kubernetes and as a compute platform, but the flavor at Red Hat, the Red Hat OpenShift container platform is very much focused in allowing installations uh, that are different everywhere, but then can be executed from your cloud provider to the antenna, to the car, to whatever you have, uh, sufficient RAM, and that's uh, up to, down to a Raspberry Pi these days. You can actually run a full stack OpenShift cluster on a Ras Raspberry Pi 4. So the, and of course that extends to a lots of more traditional uh, customers, but in many different scenarios that we would call well architected, like, uh, there's a very famous case in Brazil about the national wide uh, payment network PIX that's built on top of Red Hat and things like that. And technologies like we just saw on the previous talk and confidentiality and containers and everything still makes sense uh, in that context, right? And the idea I'm trying to sell here is that uh, you may want to run this literally everywhere. The service I use the most personally is Red Hat OpenShift on AWS because I'm more familiar with the 
Red Hat security and operations, but you could be using that on Azure with, if you prefer the uh, Microsoft side of things or have a uh, existing relationship with that cloud provider, or even with your uh, VMware infrastructure, for example. And I have to say, even without uh, touching Red Hat at all, at all like uh, we have OKD, the, the open source platform and distribution of Kubernetes, where is, you can uh, just run with pretty much a similar set of features on your own hardware, your own virtualization, things like this. I'm not going to dive too much into which is better in each case. If you would like uh, an in-depth comparison, I recommend you check learnkate.io. They have uh, excellent research training and professionals doing and updating this kind of comparisons and, and discussions. But I hope you this uh, is pretty much the value proposition of Kubernetes and delivering applications in this way, right? But the problem is that when, after you get started and launch your first cluster, when you jump in the water, you quickly face config maps, security, authentication, authorization, uh, delivery, and many things that will keep you thinking like, is this well architected? Is this secure, reliable, performant? Can I go to production with this? So it's uh, a very, especially if you're, it's the first application or if you're just getting familiar with OpenShift and, and Kubernetes in general, this is, uh, very much true for, for us all. And because the, in the end, you, you get in, uh, in this balance between evolutionary, being evolutionary and starting from scratch and just building things up, or trying to make it po well polished and uh, demonstrably good, let's say, with tests and so on and so forth. So, uh, what I want to say is just don't be the, um, uh, what, what are the things that you should really care and you just can't uh, let for let later, let's say, or think about uh, what, what's the things that usually cause problems in these automation scenarios and the things that I suggest we absolutely don't sacrifice. So first, security as a shared responsibility and job zero, the security of those automations is very important. So that's what I'm going to share some thoughts about in this talk. Demonstrate how to demonstrate the reliability and how to roll out changes reliably. And more importantly, how to keep collaboration. Because what I see is that when we get afraid to make changes, collaboration suffers a lot. So uh, that's uh, true in, in many senses, and I'm gonna dive deeper into each of those topics and show you how to automate that. So we don't get this in the situation that if it's working, don't, don't move it, don't change it, right? We get this, uh, pressure that on some things, we want to change it as fast as possible and roll out new virtual machines with API calls. We know how easy that is, but on the other side, we must keep chain things stable and compatible and tested. So how do we, how can we keep this uh, without uh, too much complexity? Let's say that's the, the whole point, like balancing this occasion. And the first thing you have to think is if you want just auto deployment or if you want to auto provision things. So the first thing, the first step in your automation journey is usually run the, the commands to deploy your code on an infrastructure that already exists. So for example, you already have a cluster and you just have to push those changes, but as uh, automation matures, we probably want to start provisioning new resources automatically. So just not uh, create uh, 
change, perhaps not change the existing server, but creating a new server with the, the image already in, because this is uh, a fundamental change in automation brought by cloud computing, because before cloud, you had the server and you don't have an option you have to change its contents. So that's the way people use it to do things. Right now, if you use uh, another server and flip the traffic instead of, uh, and, and just kill the, the old one, perhaps you have for a little while, you have two servers, but the end cost is pretty much the same. So why not provision a new one, right? So that's where we, we're trying to go, but of course, the first step is just going through this deployment and then trying to provision things with uh, resources with the application already deployed. And that brings us to this immutable infrastructure idea. And we have many projects around that at, at Red Hat. So the idea is instead of changing resources, provision a copy, provision new resources, and don't change it. So that's very good because uh, it allows you to have more freedom in many senses. So let me tell you a, a few benefits. If you can do this approach, I'm not saying that everybody should or can, but if you can, it certainly makes things a lot easier. First, because you have a, a reduced need for authentication, authorization, auditing, and things like that. What I mean is, uh, imagine that your server already boots up with an image with everything configured and ready to run a web server, let's say for a web application. So why would you need for SSH or login or uh, shell or anything that's uh, not there? So if anything fails, you should debug in the automation and perhaps in a debug environment, you might have a login and access and uh, identity management, identity providers, open ID, open ID connect, all that stuff. Uh, perhaps you can cut that out just by automating the delivery of those artifacts, right? And that um, also makes it as reliable as before. There is not that case like, who changed this? Why does it stop working? Uh, did someone deploy yesterday? So no things, you don't change uh, resources like, like uh, containers and, or, or servers or even functions, whatever that is, we publish new ones. And that makes it very simple to roll back. So uh, as long as you keep the old version, perhaps it's just a matter of flipping the DNS traffic from, uh, official name to name one to name two they'll just do the c name swap on the dns that's one way to do it or change the the target on the load balancers or anything like that but uh you are safe that for example if the new version has a bug or has an issue you can roll back to the to the previous one right and that means uh you can push things or make changes from day one. So a problem we see in many customers is that people take a long time to feel comfortable to push changes to production, where if you have this uh, safety net of simple rollbacks, you can just let people push code to master on the first day. Why not? If you have automation uh, in this sense, it's, pretty much safe. And also this lets you have that fast feedback loops and uh, feed uh, feedback about features, about things, uh, new metrics, new, whatever it is that we're launching. And that's not necessarily more expensive because if your application is using um, auto scaling and cloud computing in general, not wasting resources, like just keeping it to the resources it uses. As you change and roll out versions, uh, one environment is drained out as the other grows. So the sum keeps pretty much the same 
in the end. So you do have an overhead because for a while you may have uh, both environments at the same time or things like that, but that's not too much more expensive. And it brings in the discussion of infrastructure as code, right? You don't roll out this manually. You can't do a new, uh, you know, that go to that web console, click twice, run this shell script. This kind of thing doesn't work. So we have to automate that through Git and through infrastructure as code, right? And again, it's not uh, a one thing. We, it seems that it's just, well, uh, build your infrastructure this way and you're done. It's not. It's a matter of evolving the software delivery process. First, you learn how to make immutable deployments and you know have new resources with everything deployed correctly using your favorite infrastructure as code tool. Then you acquire that blue-green capability, let's say, to flip from one to the other and just release changes without the risk of not being able to quickly roll back. As I said, that's the first step. Then we go to this uh, extensions of blue-green. First, you can have blue and other colors. It could be blue, green, red, yellow, or canary releases, as they usually say. The first idea that comes to mind is, well, so let's roll out, test the new environment, make sure it works for like 1% of the users, then scale it to 5%, then to 10%, usually with weighted DNS, but again, it could be done by load balancing or other mechanisms, but slowly rolling out and ensuring the safety of operations, and that's canary deployments. And further than that, you might opt in to classes of users such as internal or beta or just a city and circle your users and route them to different uh, application versions or, or flags. So that's a uh, uh, way towards circle deployments. And again, this is not a matter of best or better. It's uh, thinking what of those approaches is more uh, suitable for your company. Perhaps just having blue-green deployments with two environments that you can flip back and forth is all right. And I see many customers being successful with that. For, in like, for example, in the AWS Elastic Beanstalk service, that's just one click. Or also in Kubernetes, it's uh, very easy, right? Uh, well, I hope uh, it's I hope it's all right. Let me know. I can repeat anything. My internet is not too bad. It's a good connection, but sometimes it may flick or no internet weather. Let's see. Feel free to drop in any question. Thanks for the for the heads up. Yeah. And let's go towards the, the more specific advices. And uh, again, you can automate this in pretty way you want. Uh, the one thing I usually say is don't move data around. Try to avoid. This is the more expensive thing. Perhaps when you do it in your local development machine, copying a database may be real quick and no problem. But as the application grows and grows and grows and it, your database becomes a data lake, moving these things is extremely expensive. So uh, that's the problem, for example, with Helm charts. Uh, sometimes you don't want to make a very direct dependency between your application and your database because perhaps you want to update your data, your application 10 times a day but and change where it runs but your database and data is probably a bit more difficult right so that's something we usually keep so that's what i when i say uh when you automate when you build those scripts don't try to build a single deploy dot sh that deploys everything or a single github action but do this tier by tier so well 
the, the database is something you don't want to execute every day. Let's say you have a weekly or monthly maintenance window for that because there are so many applications that depend on this. I don't know. For the API, perhaps when they are released every hour, if they want, they can deploy. For the app, perhaps you want that uh with a different uh, release cycle for example if you are published on the ios app store or google app store or any app store they have the restrictions on release frequency you can do perhaps you want to do this uh, differently so all those automations if you want to have like this master helm chart or this master script that do it all i think it's very hard to make it actually work because it will have so many failure modes and conditions, it's probably better to have a very simple automation for each of those cases. And some you may not even automate at all. For example, the CDN tier, if you use Cloud, for example, or, or CloudFront from AWS, you probably uh, you can uh, roll out that automatically with infrastructure as code, but most customers just don't. And again, uh, when you design uh, for this, especially in the Kubernetes world, this means that multi-cluster is a necessity, right? You don't want to run uh, everything in the same cluster. And just one problem that arises from the many is updating the version, for example, of Kubernetes. Uh, perhaps you don't want to, uh, perhaps something, impedes you to improve your database Kubernetes version, but you have your application on another cluster, so you can update that. So it doesn't make sense to lock in everything, everyone to the constraints of every system. That's how things get frozen up. So uh, I suggest breaking down first by tier or purpose, like we mentioned, database, network, storage, compute. Also by grade or data, such as development, staging, pre-production, production. And again, this is like the data realm, the data that the application will see. And perhaps uh, only on the application tier, on the UI, for example, you may want uh, different circles to have different versions. But again, this is uh, uh, mostly for product tests for startups, not so much for enterprises. So this depends a bit on your context. And here, uh, thinking about, so uh, it's, there are so many different technologies and possibilities for building this that we usually end up in the paradox of choice. If you don't know this talk, that talk by Barry Schwartz, it's brilliant. Uh, the idea is very simple, right? Anyone that's been to the Cloud Native Foundation website and list of projects see, like, choice is a good thing. It's nice to have choices, but sometimes we have so many that we just get paralyzed by not being able to make the, the optimal choice. So I think that's a, a very critical problem in automation and, and GitOps. So we, we end up, oh, I need this, I can improve with that and try to draw it better and better and better. And, in, and the customer is there <laughs> waiting for uh, whatever is the new uh, cloud native thing we're trying to bring into the project. So what I wanna say is for many, many, projects, I've seen it work with just a small shell script with YAML processing. So if all you need is run a simple GitHub action that changes YAML and, and call kubectl or OC, by all means, that, that's perfect. So in this sense, there is this awesome Kubernetes project. It's in the references or the links, don't worry, but this is a very nice one with tips of different tools and processors you can use to, to automate it. But uh, very soon, you're gonna need infrastructure as code and something like Terraform, my favorite, or CloudFormation, 
or even end cloud formation, like something that you can store and build on Git and store those templates and keep building on Git. That's declarative. So you don't have to try catch exceptions in each of your commands because the infrastructure uh, interpreter is going to do that. Some things that let you repeat those deployments as often as you need and as clear as uh, you want. So if you want to roll out red, blue, green, yellow, magenta environments, that's OK. Preferably, preferably something that's extensible, something that you have a way to plug in your own resources when you want. So uh, in Terraform, that would be Terraform plugins and providers. In CloudFormation, it would be modules and custom resources. On CDK, it would be constructs. Every platform uh, should have uh, this way. So you're not uh, in the woods when you want to call your create your API resource or something that only exists inside your company or your context or something like that. Something composable that you can build blocks and share, preferably. So the application team can reuse the database that the database team built and things like that. And I see many options that are partially managed, like uh, you can, you, if you use Terraform, Terraform stores a state in a backend that can be anywhere you want. So you can use a simple S3 bucket and store your infrastructure data there. And that's something that you still have to manage, create an S3 bucket, but that's OK, because everything is managed by AWS, and that's that's fine. But of course, if you want it fully managed, you have uh, Terraform Cloud or CloudFormation-based services on AWS that can manage uh, all those resources for you. And finally, uh, those are not some things that you can use one or the other. So always keep a look for integration opportunities, for example. Uh, there is this resource mentioned here in this snippet, uh, CloudFormation Stack, where you can call a CloudFormation Stack from your Terraform resource. So uh, if by any reason, such as there is no plugging yet for a given service for Terraform and you need to bridge to CloudFormation, I don't know, for whatever reason, you can't do this kind of thing. And again, you have uh, the full power of uh, getting the things like the branch name and uh, putting your own tags and setting up the, the infrastructure the, the way you, you need it, right? And the most important part of that, of having that as code, is being able to collaborate with branches, PRs, threads, and the same way we do on GitHub and make that part of our architecture. So if I want to add a new server, I add a line in that uh, declarative file. And if I need approval, I can ask in the, in the PR and use the same mechanisms and the same techniques we've been using for software now being able to use that for infrastructure. And here is uh, GitHub Actions. Uh, that's what I use the most, but there you, you have the same for any other platform. Here's the different events that can trigger actions. So you can have something that runs on a schedule every night, something that runs on a discussion comment. If someone says approves and he's a manager, that triggers the pipeline. I don't know. On a label that someone adds, like a label that this is released or tested or something like this, or on a push on a new branch. So when a new branch, uh, one that I do often is, when a new branch with a given name comes in, such as live uh, and a given branch name, uh, that will actually deploy a new environment and push that version for testing and things like that. Or a release, when there's a new release in your GitHub, or even manually, you can run those workflows. So if you have automation, and this is a good one, because uh, remember that problem, 
uh, works on my machine. Like you have your version of Python, your dependencies, and you forget to tell the customer they need that and you want your automation to run uh, anywhere. So being able to run those manually and say, well, just log into the uh, action list, or in this case, the GitHub actions and execute this and it's fixed. So that works. You can test that to work every time. That's uh, convenient, I believe. And a very important part, I think this is the, the one that most people struggle the most, is where to manage configuration. So this is a, a very important part, like how do I know uh, the database URL, the which environment variables to set, those values and so on and so forth. So one thing, uh, the, this is like the order that I think about it, like first by naming conventions. So if the branch has a name like prod slash name of something, I'll provision an environment in the circle prod, like in, uh, and bind it to the prod namespaces or DNS names and that will drive them to what we refer as prod and a new environment with that name. You know. Or uh, environment variables, most tools support that. So that's uh, when we can't infer the information, the configuration from the naming conventions, check the environment variables. If that's something can, that uh, is a long file, such as, I don't know, a key file perhaps, or a data file of some sort that you wouldn't put on an environment variable, perhaps check the, the infrastructure, the repository content itself for that key, where it will have a YAML file or whatever is the file under that name. And that's when you have the one delivery for your software, just your app, let's say, but when you have multiple deliveries of your software, say like WordPress, where you have one source, but million deployments, you might want to host that deployment content in a separate repo. And that's what tools like Tektron and OpenShift CI CD in general works. Like you have your code uh, deployment, your code source, where from your, your container image is going to be built usually and a separate repository with your YAML descriptors for Kubernetes and things like that, that are going to be pushed to production. And just remember to take a special care with secrets, like uh, GitHub has secrets mechanism, HashiCorp has Vault, and Vault has integration with everything. AWS has systems manager, parameter store, and even if you're rich enough to pay for it, a service called Credentials Manager, which is a bit overpriced in my opinion. Uh, but all of that is to set and ex save credentials, secrets in a way that's secure and won't cause problems such as committing that key to a GitHub file or uh, end up with that exposed, that's something you really don't want to do, especially if you're in a regulated situation, which can have uh, severe legal implications. And after that, it's just a matter of integrating with observability. So it's not done. You still have to pick up metrics, being the CPU, memory, HTTP counts, and things like that. The logs from the applications, see if anything is throwing an exception or anything like that. Throwing alarms according to these conditions captured by logs and metrics, doing events and traces. And you can do this on CloudWatch or Prometheus. There's uh, many different tools for observability. I just added them so as a first as a reminder that something you can do this and mention this, these tools, but to get into the, the, the importance of that. So this is a fault tolerance demonstration from this is actually a tool called Visceral by Netflix that draws these simulations. And it shows the kind of approach I'm trying to show here. So uh, it starts with three environments, uh, say Netflix application in three different uh, US regions. And you can see in US East 1, the region 
starts uh, increasing the error rates. And when it gets to a high threshold of error rates, it will start sending traffic to the to the other regions so that the other regions can scale and prepare to to take over while this uh, recovers and again just to remember by this day in prime hours netflix occupies around 40 percent of us total us bandwidth so it's uh, a lot of data flowing around and you watching your favorite series, you don't even see a flick because of this kind of uh, redundancy mechanism. And then things get fixed and rolled back because again, of that capability of rolling back and forth. Not saying everyone should have this kind of capability of visualization or failing over and failing back. Again, this is huge, but just showing what kind of automation we can build towards, right? And uh, on the Kubernetes world, this is usually done by operators, right? This kind of automation. And they're not going to build the dozens and dozens of scripts to roll things back and forth and automate and send these messages and control those things. So on operators are Kubernetes applications that can basically create resources that are of whatever resource type you name it and trigger actions to create, read, delete, and update them. So not uh, nothing too hard. Uh, and there is a SDK for building those, but as uh, OpenShift, and this is important because OpenShift itself, it's essentially in its core, a set of operators for Kubernetes with additional security, CI, CD, rollout, and all these benefits I've been mentioning. So that's why uh, it's cool. And when you build these operators, you have this maturity model that guides you through the steps of starting with the basic install, just getting code deployed and ran in the cluster, how to upgrade versions, how to influence the lifecycle of resources up to this autopilot level where things happen <laughs> magically. And uh, operators get real can get really advanced and there are certainly examples such as the helm ansible and and go operators around that so all in all uh, it's basically using infrastructure as code and manage operations with uh, resources declaratively like and keep collaboration for git and Keep more than keeping it through Git is keeping it alive in a way that people is not afraid to touch infrastructure just because it's risky or it's not automated or we can do it only at six months and etc. And uh, a final thought is to separate, uh, and this is important in con for continuous delivery is separate the idea of a release and a deployment, right? You can deploy a hundred times a day, right? But you may only release on Christmas, right? Uh, it's like when your favorite applications shows a Christmas, a nice Christmas message. That code was already there, perhaps since spring, but it has a little check uh, or a feature flag as we say, that that's going to be available only for prime users on Christmas. And there was uh, a long while ago, uh, people used it to create new branches for new features and create hundreds of branches and merge them in a very complicated way, for usually known as Git flow and things like that. But since I think 2016, the state of uh, DevOps report by Puppet Labs demonstrated pretty clearly that uh, basically committing to master and using feature flags is way more sane and productive. And because of this, you can create those feature flags and deploy that code hidden. And of course, there's tools for that from open source to services like LaunchDarkly and things like this that allows you to 
deploy and release in different uh, steps and ceremonies. Right? If you want to practice those concepts I just mentioned, for all of that, we have learn.openshift.com where you get a cluster and a tutorial and you can build and practice those automations. Uh, here are the references for this talk. First, I'm starting to write. So it, it's a very small, just two posts at the moment, uh, but including these slides are on this new dev to red hacks I've been building. The awesome Kubernetes reference with lots of commands and cool stuff about automation. The learn OpenShift GitOps uh, is specifically for uh, our way of building those concepts. And learn Kates is a separate company, but uh, with cool courses and material. And finally, my friend Mauricio Salatino is publishing a book, Continuous Delivery for Kubernetes, where you can also find great insights on bringing this to reality. And that's it for my talk. I think we have five minutes. If you have any questions now or later, it would be a great pleasure to keep in touch with you. Thank you so much for attending this talk and enjoy DevConf.